You are in for a treat today. This is Shelly Mitchell, and she's a horticulture youth specialist at Oklahoma State University. She works with students a lot, but she happens to be one of our teacher's favorite presenters because she has high energy with lots of knowledge. So sit back and enjoy. And Shelly, I'm going to let you take it away. Like she said, I'm Shelly Mitchell. I spent ten, not nine years teaching high school science in Stillwater. And while I was doing that, I realized just how bad ag literacy is, not only in this state, but everywhere. I had 10th graders, mostly. And one time I put a, a piece of a cotton plant after the harvest, I just put it on my desk. And some of the kids asked me why I glued cotton balls to a stick. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been the youth specialist in horticulture. And one of the things I do is I run a two week Regents Academy for teenagers in the summer for two weeks and they learn about horticulture. Um, in one of those camps, I had a 15 year old girl come up to me with an orange and ask what it was. And I said it was an orange. And she said, I've never seen one of those before. I've only seen little oranges that are shaped like smiles. And I'm like, okay, well, this, this is what it looks like before it's peeled and divided. So we have kids, you know, even high school kids who don't know where the food comes from. They can't even recognize the food. So that's why I got more and more into ag literacy. And that's kind of how I ended up in this job. So today we're going to talk about uh, cheeseburgers. And we're going to talk about how basically all the parts of a cheeseburger go back to plants. So we're going to talk about the six parts of a plant and we are going to build a cheeseburger and at the same time we're going to draw a cheeseburger. If we had done this in person, we'd all be making felt cheeseburgers and doing the drawing, but most of you will probably be, just be doing the drawing. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the six parts of a plant. So we have the roots. And that is what anchors the plant into the ground and that's where water comes in. We have the stems that helps the plant stand up and it's also where the water and the carbohydrates made from photosynthesis go throughout the plant. The leaves are where, where the plant does most of its photosynthesis and the flowers are not every plant makes flowers, but any kind of plant that produces a fruit or a vegetable makes flowers. When they get pollinated and fertilized, they swell up into a fruit and the seeds are in the fruit. And the fruit's not necessarily something we eat. It could be something like an acorn or a maple seed. So not all fruits we eat. Okay, so if we would also be doing a song about the six parts of the plant, but I'm not gonna do that today. If you wanna watch the song, and actually, there was an Oklahoma gardening episode that we just did about this, the six parts of a plant and what some of the food you eat, what part of the plants they're from. If you go on YouTube, there's an Oklahoma gardening channel. It's the one that actually goes to the show Oklahoma gardening on PBS and every episode is uploaded to YouTube right after it happens. And so like the last week or two, it's been, it's aired. It's called the six parts of the plant we eat. So if you go to YouTube and Google Oklahoma gardening and then my name, it'll be one of the things that comes up. So if you want to sing the song and do it with your kids, you can go there and look and it's, you can watch it as many times as you want. Share it, share it with your kids, whatever. Okay. So we're going to talk about a cheeseburger, where it comes from, what the parts are, where those parts of the plant are from. So hopefully everybody has a piece of paper and some markers. We are going to draw this cheeseburger and make one at the same time. Now these activities are coming from Giant Cheeseburger, which was an Oklahoma Ag in the Classroom uh, activity. And I got this activity because when I went on, on the road with Ag in the Classroom, it was like early 2000s and we went to the Northwest part of the state and before we went, we gathered at some county extension office and made these things. All right, so I use this to demonstrate when I, dem when I talk about this with kids, but this is what you make if you do the giant cheeseburger activity. So you got the bun and you got a piece of lettuce, all right? 
and you got other ingredients. So this is what I use when I'm teaching kids. But the one we're gonna make is like individual size. And this activity is also found on Build-A-Burger in, in the, that Ag in the Classroom lesson. So we're gonna draw a hamburger. So as everybody's ready, we're gonna do this. It's really awkward to not be in person. All right, so at the top of your paper, I want you to draw the top of a bun. All right, and make sure it's at the top because we're gonna make an exploded version of a hamburger. So don't try to squish it too much. All right, so you're gonna draw that and color it in brown. All right, and when we do that, we talk about, you know, we have a, we have a bun here. All right, and what is the bun made of? All right. This is really hard with that interaction. Okay, the bun's made of wheat. Let's just say wheat, all right? And where does that grow? You could talk about where it grows in Oklahoma or the world, you know, if you teach geography or whatever, you could talk about even like how it was domesticated. It just depends on how deep you wanna go. If you're teaching little kids, you could be like, uh, what color is this? I mean, you know, it can go all over the place. You can measure it if you're doing math. So anyway, you talk about wheat, where it comes from, and is wheat a plant? So I label it wheat, which is a plant. And then you have all these little sesame seeds on top, all right? And those also come from a plant. And that plant is a little plant and it usually grows in Asia and they harvest the seeds and they have a lot of oil. So that's what they make, that's where they get the sesame seeds. Now we make felt hamburgers. You take a piece of tan cloth, you cut it into the shape of a circle, and then the kids can use a Sharpie to put little sesame seeds on there if they want. Okay, the next thing is underneath the bun, draw a piece of cheese. All right, and then you're gonna color it in yellow or, you know, whatever color, you I mean, you might have blue cheese, I don't know. Anyway, I just make it yellow for the, for the kids because that's what they mostly know is cheese. And we talk about where does cheese come from? Cheese comes from milk and milk comes from cows. <laughs> and what do cows eat? All right, they eat plants. So even though we're eating a hamburger that's from, you know, from cattle, the milk, the meat, it still originates from plants somehow. And if you really want to get specific, it all originates from the sun. All right. So everybody take a piece of yellow felt and you have your cheese. Now, some people will cut little circles in there and have Swiss cheese. It's up to you, whatever you want to have, but I take a piece of yellow felt and that's the cheese. And then on here, I write that cheese comes from milk which comes from cows which eat plants so even though it's a hamburger it's still a plant all right the next thing we do is we draw a tomato so where do tomatoes come from they grow on bushes or vines all right what is a tomato what part of the plant would a tomato be all right it'd be a fruit and the reason it'd be a fruit is because it has seeds inside and the uh, legal definition of a tomato is it's a vegetable. And there's a story behind that. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, the tomato people didn't wanna pay the fines that vegetables, when vegetables and fruits got imported, um, vegetables had to pay an extra tax, but fruits didn't. And so the tomato people were like, hey, well, we're a fruit. So, you know, we should not have to pay this. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court didn't have an official definition, just whatever they saw in the dictionary. So they actually pulled random people in from the street and said, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? And since it wasn't sweet, most people said vegetable. So legally the tomato is a vegetable, even though it's really a fruit. So you color it in, tomato, plant, it's the fruit, it has seeds inside. And when you're making your tomato, you can take a piece of red felt and you make some little tomato slices. You can just make them plain or you can cut out the juicy bits, whatever you want. All right, the next thing is lettuce, all right? 
So there's different kinds of lettuce. There's leaf lettuce, there's head lettuce. A lot of people get iceberg lettuce on their burger and iceberg lettuce doesn't have very many nutrients. But when there was a study done on the fruits and vegetables most Americans consume, there was like eight. And we have iceberg lettuce, carrots, tomatoes in the form of ketchup, apples in the form of apple juice, potatoes in the form of french fries, and then a couple other things. But people really don't have much experience with a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. So one thing I do with kids is I take some fruits and vegetables. First, I ask if there's any allergies. Then I take fruits and vegetables and I cut them into itty bitty little pieces that wouldn't really be recognizable. And if I'm doing something like carrots, I'll get the purple kind. So it kind of freaks kids out because they're not expecting a carrot taste. And so I've used like jicama and bell pepper and bits of cantaloupe, but hopefully small enough that the kids can't recognize it. If they do recognize it, I tell them not to tell anybody what it is. And we have this taste test where we have the five senses listed. So, you know, smell and taste and touch and all that. And then across it has A, B, C, D, F, just like grades. And at the same time, we all pick up the orange piece or whatever. Let's just say one piece is orange. And I say, write orange in the, in the blank for what we're tasting, because I'm not going to tell you what it is till afterwards. So we all together, this thing's on a toothpick, we look at it. You just look at it without doing anything else. You just give it a grade on how it looks. All right. Then everybody smell it. You know, it doesn't matter how it looks. Doesn't matter how you think it's going to taste. Just give it a grade on how it smells. And you go through and eventually you get to the taste. So by the time they've tasted this thing, they've graded it on five different senses. And then after they've all graded it, at least then when they taste it, they're not like, mm, I don't like it. They're like, well, I didn't like it because I didn't like how it sounded in my mouth or whatever. And most kids will try a little bit. And then after it's all said and done, I'm like, okay, does anyone know what this is? And in the case of things like jicama, the kids are like, no clue. And so we talk about it and we talk about where it comes from and how you eat it and what you would eat it in. And then we have some kids from other cultures that use it and they might talk about how they have seen it in dishes. All right. So as you're going through the parts of the hamburger, just remember that a lot of kids might not have tasted some of these things like tomatoes. All right. So that's another side activity that's really good. But okay, so we have a piece of green felt and we cut it into a piece of leaf lettuce. All right, so then we, we draw, we write next to it that it's lettuce, it came from a plant. What part of the plant? It's a leaf, all right? Where do they grow? Do they grow on a bush? Do they grow on a tree? Do they grow underground? No, they grow on the ground. Then you could talk about like, can you grow it here? How long does it take? When does it grow? Like, do we plant it in the spring or the fall? You can take this any way you want, but if hey, nothing Shelley. else, what? I'm sorry to interrupt you. There are some people wondering, um, do you have a template with the A through F scale and a line to write that? There are several wanting that. Um, if you do, we can share that with your resources. All right, I'll put that down as, a, yeah, I have it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, make sure to interrupt me because I'll just keep talking for hours. Are we doing good on time? What time is it? Okay. So the next thing is the patty. Now, some people eat beef patties. Some kids actually think hamburgers come from ham. All right, this is true, unfortunately. If you have vegetarians, this could also be a soybean patty. So you can, you know, modify it to suit your needs. All right, so where does a hamburger patty come from? It comes from cattle, right? And you could talk about how we raise them in feedlots or they raise them in the pasture, you know, and a lot of times it's just ground up meat from different parts of the cattle that isn't steak or whatever. Sometimes it comes from old dairy cattle, but anyway, it comes from cattle. What do cattle eat? Plants, all right? So you say beef comes from cattle, cattle eat plants. So there's the beef patty. And when I make a beef patty with kids, sometimes they like to add sizzle marks with a Sharpie. I just let them have fun with it. Sometimes they don't wanna add sizzle marks, whatever, but they're making this their way. 
All right, the next thing we talk about, all right, these are onion slices. Now, I have them in purple, white, and yellow to reiterate the fact that onions don't just come in white, all right? A lot of kids have never had onions. Those that do might think there's only white onions, but I, as I do this, I try to make sure that kids understand, like there's purple carrots, you know, there's brown tomatoes, there's yellow onions, so the kids realize there's more out there. And that's why I do those taste tests, so they can see, oh, there's purple carrots, yeah? You know, the only reason that you see orange carrots mostly these days, even though carrots come in a wide variety of colors, is because one of the places they grew it a lot was over in uh, Holland. And there was like a Duke of Orange. Anyway, orange was like their national color. And somebody was harvesting carrots and up comes one that's orange. So after that, that's all they planted because it was like their national color. And so they were a big exporter of carrots. And so people just assumed they were all orange, but now in the supermarkets, you're seeing the other colors. So you can explain to kids that different things come in different colors. Sometimes they have different tastes. You know, with what do you put on your hamburgers? Do you put purple ones or yellow ones or white ones? Everybody's got their own taste. So what I do with those is I take a pipe cleaner. So I have orange ones and white ones and purple ones. And we just make a little loop out of it. All right. So you have purple, white, and yellow, and you make little onions to go on your sandwich. Now I tell the kids, this doesn't mean you're actually gonna eat onions on your cheeseburger, but this is just main ingredients. So just go with the flow. If you don't wanna put onions on your particular cheeseburger, that's fine. So then I write next to it onions and they're a plant. Now, where do they grow? Do they grow in the ground on a tree? Because kids have no clue half the time, all right? They grow in the ground. So they're a root, all right? So that's it's one of the parts of a plant. All right, what's next? Okay, pickles. <laughs> pickles are fun. With those, I just take a, a dark green piece of felt and we cut out little pickles. Now, kids a lot of times think that cucumbers come from pickles. I have no idea where they get this, but that's, that's a common misconception. So we talk about how pickles come from cucumbers and cucumbers are plants. What part of a plant are they? Well, if they haven't ever seen one cut in half, you can cut one in half and inside there are little seeds. Okay, so that makes a pickle what? It makes a pickle a fruit because it comes from a cucumber that's a fruit and they grow on bushes, all right? And if you have a school garden, you can be growing these things along the, uh, during the school year and some things grow in the fall, some things grow in the spring, a lot of things grow in the summer, but some of these, especially like radishes, you can actually grow indoors. So don't be afraid to grow some of these yourself, all right? And if you need help with a school garden or finding funding or convincing your principal, that's what I do. I come and train teachers how to use gardens to teach concepts to kids that are part of the curriculum. So instead of adding gardening to your curriculum, which no one has time to add anything, you can use gardening to, to go through and teach your curriculum. So uh, you can measure the height of a seedling over time and graph that. You know, you can write a little journal article or in your journal, make an entry about what do you think a worm goes through all day? How does it, you know, make a little story about the day in the life of a worm or something. So, and you know, with the history, you could talk about, like we just talked about carrots and stuff. You could also grow things that the pioneers would grow or the natives would have grown. And you can incorporate those into activities. And a lot of people have like pioneer days, stuff like that. So you can incorporate plants that way. You can even take like old wagon wheels that are like a part of history and grow things in each section that would have been grown by the pioneers. You know, there's a million different things you could do with gardening. All right, so on our hamburger, the next thing we got is a squirt of ketchup. All right, now, here's the tricky part. What is ketchup made of? Well, the main ingredient in most ketchups is corn syrup, which comes from corn, all right? 
And the other main ingredient is tomatoes. Now, if you want a little, I like to go down rabbit holes, sorry, but ketchup, if you read the book, The World History of Salt, which is actually a very interesting book, you learn that ketchup was actually made from anchovies originally. All right, what happened was back then, foods they didn't have much preservation of foods so a lot of the foods tasted bad they were spoiled but they afford not to eat them so they would put sauces on some of their meats and stuff and one of the sauces they had was like pickled anchovies that were all mushed up and put on as a sauce and so um that was pretty gross and after a while everybody got tired of eating it so then they started making ketchup out of like mushrooms or um I forget other things, but anyway, so finally that trend came to America and the Americans were like, gross, no. And they made ketchup out of um, tomatoes. Sorry, the chat's kind of bothering me. <laughs> they made ketchup out of tomatoes. All right. And so everybody started using ketchup with, made out of tomatoes. Now, here's another interesting bit of history. People in the Philippines really liked ketchup from America made out of tomatoes. Well, then one of the big world wars broke out. I think it was World War II. And the tomatoes were shipped in from America and other places, but they really loved their ketchup and they didn't have tomatoes. So they're like, well, we want ketchup. What are we going to do? Well, they didn't have many tomatoes, but they had a lot of bananas. So they made ketchup out of bananas. And what they did is after they mushed up the bananas and all that, they dyed it red. If you go to the grocery store and look in the international food aisle, there is banana sauce ketchup like bottle and it's red it tastes like really sweet ketchup and it's actually pretty good so that's another thing you could bring into if you taught history you could bring ketchup in and talk about all the different history of ketchup it's just sorry i go down rabbit holes anyway so make sure when you write the ketchup you've got the fact that it comes from corn and it comes from tomatoes and ketchup is actually the way that most kids get their tomatoes besides like tomato sauce for the spaghetti. So you might want to bring a whole tomato in and show them. And this is my squiggle of ketchup made from a red piece of felt. <laughs> All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a squiggle of mustard. All right, so here's my mustard, my little squiggle of mustard. And where does mustard come from? It's kind of like sesame seeds. It comes from a plant, not very tall. The little seeds are what you're eating, in this case, mushed up with vinegar and stuff. So mustard is a plant. It's actually crushed seeds. So it came from a fruit. Usually fruits like that, like sesame and mustard come in little pods, all right? Just like green beans and stuff. All right, the next thing is mayonnaise. Now, mayonnaise is kind of tricky because you've got the kids, they might have had mayonnaise before, but they might not know the main ingredients are vegetable oil and eggs. So let's take the eggs. Where do eggs come from? Chickens, all right? What do chickens eat? Well, they eat little grains and stuff. They also eat little bugs and snakes. If they ate a snake, what'd the snake eat? Probably bugs. What'd the bugs eat? plants. So it all goes back to plants, even though it doesn't look like it does, it does. And then vegetable oil comes from different vegetables, different seeds and stuff that all get smushed. It depends on what, what you've got, but vegetables are plants. All right. And I take a piece of white felt and make mayonnaise blob. All right. So when you finish off with the bottom bun all right this is your finished burger it's the exploded version all right and not all those little annotations are going to fit on the side so you know you can put them down here or whatever but you can have the kids make this out of poster board or construction paper or felt or you can just have them draw it like we did here and whatever you want to do with it like i said you can trace the history of different ingredients you could trace how they were domesticated originally, how they traveled across the world. You know, they usually come with people who are moving and they want to bring their homeland with them. All right, so they come that way and then other people adopt them. You can, you know, if you're doing food stuff, you can 
make like stone soup or you can make salsa you can make stuff and measure and cut and all that um english you could talk about when i was in 10th grade we had this assignment to describe how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich all right <laughs> and if you just put pe put peanut butter on bread the teacher was going by your instructions and she would smear it everywhere so that'd be a good journal entry how to make a hamburger but they have to be really specific especially if you're going to make it there in uh in front of them all right of course the science you can talk about the parts of the plant and how they all grow and and all the different kinds of fruits all right so then you put the bottom bun on there's another piece hey, shelly one second someone is asking what was written under the vegetable oil with the mayo oh i think i just put vegetables yep. okay vegetables and plants all right thank you yep and then usually when i'm doing this in person we do this on a big piece of paper all right and so I have, we have the six parts of the plant on one part of it. And then the notes remind me that we sing a song, which again, you can go on YouTube and look at. All right. And then there's the parts of the hamburger. And another thing I have them do is we write down what plants need to grow. All right. I don't want you to see that much of it because what I want you to write is I want you to write plants, P-L-A-N-T-S. And then the kids guess what plants need to grow and everything a plant needs to grow is represented by one of those letters so the kids might say they need sun to grow okay that's under l for light so the plants the l stands for light um, depending on how old they are the kids might say that plants need carbon dioxide or air so a is for air um, if they mention fertilizer and you could talk about depending on their age nitrogen phosphorus potassium all the other nutrients. N is for nutrients. Uh, P is for place. Some, some uh, plants like to grow in the sun or the shade. They like to grow in hot areas or cooler areas. Um, S is for, you can say soil, but with all the hydroponics and stuff, you don't, it doesn't have to be soil. So you could use that for space. Because if you put too many plants too close together, they start competing for nutrients and competing for water and competing for sun. So they all need different spaces. So if you were teaching math, <clears throat> what you could do is you could pass out seed packets and on the back of each seed packet, it talks about spacing for each plant. And so you could actually have them take a piece of paper and give them some garden size, like say four foot by eight foot and have them decide what they want to grow and have them look at the packages and go, okay, radishes have to be an inch apart. So you can put a whole bunch in this square foot area. But if you want to grow a tomato, that's going to take like two, three or four feet of your garden. So they can look at the different sizes of plants requirements and that's a little math activity. How many could you get in a square foot if you can put onions as far apart or whatever? So that's another activity. Um, okay, and then T is kind of tricky. It's for thirsty because plants need water. So it's kind of iffy on that. But if you write all those things down, it spells out plants. The kids can try to figure out what all those things are. And you can talk about like, what does a plant do with sun? What does a plant do with air? And it just depends on what level you are as to how in depth you go. Um, some parts of the plant do need oxygen because photosynthesis is where they they take the sunlight and water and carbon dioxide and they make sugars but when you're using energy to grow or to make a flower you have to have the reverse of that you start with sugar and break it down you take sugar and oxygen you break it down into carbon dioxide and water so basically photosynthesis and respiration are completely opposite each other and so they're complementary and plants produce oxygen but they also consume it but for little kids usually it's just enough if they know that plants take in co2 and we take in oxygen and it's a it's a mutual symbiotic relationship kind of um, shelly they're asking is tea for time it's for thirsty thirsty okay thank you 
the water. That's kind of tricky, I know, but. And if you want a lot of, um, a lot of activities you can do with different levels, different uh, ages, different subjects, if you email me, I can send you links. I also have about an 11 page document on um, ways to incorporate gardening in the classroom and also links to things like online interactive experiences with gardening and videos on like how they harvest pineapples. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. So if you email me or I can email Audrey that I also have about 20 pages when I do garden day camp activities. I have about 20 pages of activities that are all free or cheap because I used to be a teacher with a $0 budget. So I get it. All right. I still don't have much of a budget, but all those activities have been tested by kids over and over and over. And they're really popular activities. I star them and all that. So those are other ways to integrate plants into your curriculum. And I'm the state junior master gardener, uh, state coordinator. So I travel around and if you guys want to do a school garden, or even if you don't want to do a school garden, if you want to have a little bit of hydroponics, or if you want to do a windowsill garden, or if you just want to incorporate plants into your classroom, I can come to professional development days and do hands-on presentations and um, help you figure out like, if you are going to do a school garden, you don't need 10 acres and a tractor, all right? You just need like, you could get some five gallon buckets. You could zip tie guttering to a fence. There's a million ways to do it. And most of the obstacles people say, I can't do a school garden even though I want to because I have no time. Okay, we talk about how to integrate plants within the curriculum without adding it as a separate unit. I don't have any space, which we can always find space even if it's on an asphalt playground. Um, I don't have any money. Well, I'm the queen of doing things cheaply. So that's not an issue. I don't have any experience and that's where all the different curricula and lesson plans and junior master gardener stuff like that come in. So if you, if you even think you want to integrate plants into their cu curriculum, I will come teach some uh, lessons to the whole, to all the teachers. And the further out I travel, I don't, my travel budget is basically zero, but the further away from Stillwater is I will come out like, if Durant wants to do this and they could get like 20 teachers to do this, I will go to Durant. All right. And sure. uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. We have a teacher um, asking if you could show your large poster again. Oh, yep. <laughs> oh, can you see it all? Yes. All right. Thank you. This is just so awkward to do without any interaction, really. Um, also, in addition to the handouts that I can send to Audrey and she can send out, if you go on Facebook, I have a page called the Oklahoma School Garden Network, and I post links to videos. Like I just uploaded the uh, six parts of a plant video, I think. I also uploaded um, the National children and youth garden symposium was virtual this year and so i had to record and i had to record my session which was activity after activity after activity of cheap ways to use plants in day camps and schools so there's another link i also had a link to me doing a video on how to do some basic horticulture judging i upload funny videos um cheesy valentines you know that are, that i find that are related to foods you know fruits and stuff i do junior master gardener lessons if i give a training or somebody related like um somebody from the oklahoma green schools program or something is having a training i'll post those when i find grant opportunities i post those so if you want to uh like the oklahoma school garden network that's my page Try to think what else you guys want to know. But yeah, I will else have any questions for Shelly. If you do, be sure to type them in the Q&A and we'll get her to answer them. She is a wealth of knowledge for school gardens and we always get a lot of emails asking about school gardens. So I know that there are questions out there. Well, it looks like the chat's going crazy. 
We've been sharing links. Melody was able to find you singing on your uh, six parts of plants. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so we shared that one. We shared that one. There's some others that have been shared too. Well, the thing about Oklahoma gardening is it's one of the longest, it is the longest running garden show. And when it's winter here, it's summer in the other hemisphere. So our biggest consumers of Oklahoma gardening in the winter is Australia. So I'm sure there are people in Australia who will be singing that song and it's just kind of freaky to think about. <laughs> Ellie, we had a question. What is a good plant? What is good to plant when school begins? So what would be some good things to plant right as school starts? Uh, fall gardening is hard, but if you, um, if you look up the, if you go to the Oklahoma State University webpage, there's a link to extin extension fact sheets, all right? And if you're not familiar with the extension service, it started back in the Abraham Lincoln days. And basically the federal government and the state governments work together to take um, college research at the universities to the public. So if you have any questions about agriculture or family and consumer science, there's a whole list of publications that we're continually adding to. And one of those publications is called something like Fall Gardening for Oklahoma. And there will be a list of different things you can plant and the way you can know if you can plant it or not is, um, and I can Xerox this too and upload it. But there are, you look at the day that you want to harvest and then you count backwards. So let's say it takes 21 days to harvest a radish and you want to celebrate radish day on April 21st or whatever. So you would need to plant them like March 31st or April 1st. So some of the things you want to grow, you can look and especially if it's sensitive to frost, then you've got to make sure it's out of there by mid-October because our first frost is usually around mid-October in this part of Oklahoma. So okay. you can count backwards and see. Yeah, we have another one. If we do go virtual, um, so if they end up teaching virtually, what is something I can send to students that will grow in their backyard or on windowsill? I'm going to, I'm going to go with a lot of kids are in, let's just say a bunch of kids are in apartments and they don't have a yard they can work with. Um, they can take anything that'll hold soil. And a lot of times when I work with kids, I get one of those cheap dollar shoe boxes. All right. Cause that's pretty good. And you drill holes in the bottom and you put a thing of potting soil in there and they can grow herbs. You can grow this on the windowsill in or out. Those are easy to grow. Um, leaf lettuce is easy to grow. And you just harvest the leaves as, um, as they form with, you can do mint, you can do uh, cherry tomatoes in like a five gallon bucket. So that'd be more of a spring thing. But if you want to do herbs, you could pretty much do them now. So they could take anything with soil. And if you do give stuff to the kids to plant, I would recommend getting potting mix because if they go dig up soil in Oklahoma, at least around here, it's clay, and that doesn't drain very well. So potting mix is pretty cheap. You might even be able to get Lowe's or Walmart or somebody to donate a bag, and all you need is whatever fills a one, uh, just a cheap shoe box, all right, and uh, give them some two, seed. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I have two more questions we'll try to get to real fast. Okay. Um, so I would love to grow some fast-growing trees with my students as a STEM activity that goes along with some of my lessons that have to do with trees. Any suggestions? Fast growing trees would be, um, pines grow pretty fast. Um, depends if you're starting from seed, I hope not. If you're starting with saplings, I would say something native, like a red bud, it, it, it grows. I mean, we're talking about a tree, so it's not going to be like a foot a day, but, uh, Pines grow fast, but there's really nothing you can plant that's going to just shoot up within a school year, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could start with like a crepe myrtle shrub or something and watch it get bigger, but nothing's, I mean, if you wanted to do like height measurement or something, I would find several different trees around the school, but 
what activity are you wanting to do with trees that grow fast? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe we can get a little bit more follow up. I think it's just like a STEM project. Um, and then one more thing somebody else said is I think um, she should sing her song before she logs off. <laughs> Well, you have to get up, you have to stand up and do it. All right, and I can't get my whole body on here, but I will sing the song, but I'm not gonna do the motions, okay? So I can't believe you guys, okay. So you stand up, everybody stands up. This is good for kids that are hyper, all right? You just keep going until they get tired. But uh, it's to the tune of the Adams Family, or the kids told me it's the days of the week song, and then I had them sing it, because I don't know what the heck that is. But I taught high school. <laughs> anyway, so it's the tune of that. And you stand up and you point, you do touch your toes and say roots and you explain what roots do. Then you put your hands on your sides and say stems, talk about what stems do. Then you have leaves, we just wiggle your, you know, okay. And then you have a flower and you talk about flowers. And then for the fruit, you act like you're harvesting a bunch of apples so you're, you have them in your shirt and then seeds. And so <clears throat> after you've explained all the different parts of the plant, you sing it. All right, see, I guess, I wish you guys were right here. Okay, so you, this is how it goes. And please watch it on YouTube and show it as many times as you want. All right, so you go, da-na-na-na, 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 da-na-na-na. There's roots and stems and leaves, flowers, fruit, and seeds. You roll them all together. You got the parts of the plant, parts of the plant, Parts of the plant, parts of the plant, parts of the plant. That's the song. <laughs> but anyway, awesome. I would have had you guys all do that if we'd been in person, but it's really hard to do this. <laughs> you did great. Well, if anybody has any questions about this or they want to do um, plants in the classroom or they want to talk about, you know, if they want to do a school garden, how could they do it? Where would they put it? Where would they get resources? one of the biggest challenges is getting the principal uh, convinced because if the kids are doing it, which the kids need to be the ones to do it, it's not gonna look like a botanic garden. And so that's one thing that the parents, uh, the principals are like, eh, I don't want it to look like a weed patch. Well, you know what, learning is that sometimes. So I've actually gone to schools and side swiped the principal, be like, oh, you have a, such a great principal, they're letting you put a garden in. Hardly any principals do that. Isn't that awesome? Yay, principal. And I've gotten more gardens installed that way. <laughs> Whatever you gotta do. Shelly, that's great. You're getting all <laughs> kinds of compliments for your song too. It says oh, cute, yeah. whoop, whoop, love it. Parts of a plant, woohoo, that was great. All kinds of people giving me some love over here. <laughs> Well, I'll send Audrey those uh, resources at the fall gardens, the, the taste, the, the fruit tasting template, and then those uh, garden resources for educators and the day camp activities. So that'll give you like 30 pages of things to read. And uh, I don't invent half these things. I just collect them as I see them. And as I do find good ones, I do, like I said, post it on the Oklahoma School Garden Network. And if you want to contact me directly, I'm sure Audrey will give you my email. So, yes, I've already shared it. And um, also, I just want to remind everyone that we have uh, many resources that you can use with your students to go along with the gardens. So if you go on our Ag in the Classroom website under resources, you can request those and we'll send them to you for free. We have um, magazines for students. We have bookmarks for students. We even have a few seed packets that we can still send out. So um, if you'll just go on and request those, we'd be glad to send them to you. And uh, we've got some new resources on there too. So if you haven't been on our website recently, then go on there and, and we'd be glad to send those out. Are there any more questions for Shelly before we let her go? Oh, I'll be back next uh, Thursday. Yeah, you could join her again. <laughs> How many people are on the call now? Oh, we had we had several. Okay, someone just said milkweed from Monarchs would be great to grow from fall to spring. Do you know anything about that one? Um, Monarchs 
anything you plant for monarchs is always good. They have a lot of different milkweeds you can plant. Some of them are native to Oklahoma. So right now I've noticed that the milkweeds are like blooming and letting go of their seeds. So if you drive down like county roads and you see like poofy fluff coming off from like this far off the ground, collect it, that's milkweed seeds. Uh, there's also citizen science activities you can do with monarchs where you tag them and trace them. There are citizen science um, like project bud break, I think it's called. And as different trees bud out in the spring, the kids turn it in. It's like, oh, the red buds went. Now we have oak trees budding, whatever. And then they can trace across America as the trees bud. So there's lots of different. Another thing you might want to check out is Oklahoma Green Schools Network. Oklahoma Green Schools is a free program. It covers things from gardening to recycling to monitoring, uh, you know, like vampire energy sources in the school, um, air quality, water quality, how to conserve water. It's all free. They have um, trainings and they, if you complete so many investigations as a school, you get a Oklahoma Green Schools flag to put on your flagpole. So I would also suggest looking at those resources. And if you're on my news, if you're on the Facebook page, I periodically post stuff like that. So, and also on my Facebook page, I have a, in the, in the notes or menu section, I can't remember, I've posted my handouts that I'll send to Audrey also. So feel free to share, you know, steal, whatever you want to do. I know how it is as a teacher. 